Um, I'd, I'd, uh, good, you've already shut up. Um, <laughs> this, this, this is Paul Matsuda, who, um, of him and known him for a number of years, uh, particularly through some um, really essential work he's done um, for four C's NCTE regarding uh, issues of, of uh, second language and multilingual writers. Um, one of the things, uh, you'll get the full introduction this afternoon, but one of the things I've always admired about you, Paul, is that you actually get things done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so funny to say, but um, we had a grant process where um, we gave people some money to do some things, and, and here comes this wonderful report about kind of aspects of the state of second language writing instruction in the country. And, and, and clearly, um, uh, this is you know, one of the leading folks right now around the country for helping us think about um, not only issues in teaching, but how we define and understand um, uh, people whose, whose first or primary or only language is not English. So anyway, we're really happy to have him here today. Um, uh, Kelly Custer and Camilla Kenyon have have thought about a few questions to ask you, but this is really informal, and so I'll. Uh, is it? Is there anything you want to say first before we start asking you questions? Um, not really. You know, I, since I'm not familiar with the program that you have or the student population really, so I'm, I'm hoping to learn a lot about what kind of issues you're encountering, what kind of successes you've had, and what kind of concerns, and uh, see you know, where that takes us. Are we okay here? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to ask? Okay. Well, speaking of that very um, grant, I was really uh, interested in the, um, this is what uh, Dr. Matsuda put in, second language writing and college composition programs. And what I found particularly fascinating is that you were talking about how, um, because I came from a comp TESOL program, and you were talking about how the kind of theoretical bent of composition is so different from TESOL and how we need to be able to merge those. Could you just maybe outline for us what you see the differences are mm -hmm. in those two areas? Um, well, there are lots of differences. Composition, um, since the 1960s and 70s has shifted from textual orientation to more you know, process writing and also uh, the social context and the political context of writing, which is an important aspect of writing that had long been neglected. Uh, so I'm really glad to have that perspective uh, in place and institutionalized. And TESOL, on the other hand, which began to sort of develop itself as a separate discipline at about the same time in the 60s, um, came from more of a linguistics um, sort of background. And although it has somewhat separated itself from traditional sense of linguistics and more into applied linguistics, which looks at uh, the practical uh, issues that happens with, that are related to language, um, it still tends to focus more on textual issues, structures of language, and how those structures are learned and taught and used uh, in this society. So, um, so, so these orientations, um, different sort of disciplinary backgrounds, uh, tend to dis uh, create some gaps in terms of what people are trying to understand when they study writing or the teaching of writing and how they are trying to help students. And another major difference is that because the student population that specialists in second language studies are working on is somewhat different in terms of not only of their literacy background or writing background, but also in terms of the language background and as well as cultural understanding and the audience understanding. Um, some of the issues that we take for granted in the first language composition classes or mainstream composition classes cannot be necessarily taken for granted when we are working with multilingual students. Um, and the one big issue uh, that I have been working with for uh, um, the last 10 years or so is that uh, because people have developed a sense of who their students are, it's really difficult when the student population changes to adjust to that new environment. And it has happened in the ESL classes um, when 
a large number of resident ESL students, people who went to high school in this country, began to enroll in uh, separate ESL classes because those classes traditionally were set up for international students who just came from another country. And that shift is really difficult. Um, and, uh, um, and there's a lot of uh, new research that's being done, but you know, uh, we are far from fully understanding the ramifications of the population change, as well as what to do about it uh, in practical terms. And in the composition classroom, we are also seeing a rise of that population uh, because they are not international students and they may not necessarily self-identify as non-native speakers or uh, and, and in many cases they are residents of this country so they want to identify themselves with the rest American students rather than international students. So for these reasons identifying the student population and understanding where they come from what their needs are is becoming more and more difficult whereas uh, 20 years ago 30 years ago we could more or less assume who the students were and where they were coming from, although there were complexities. The kind of complexities that we were dealing with back then, uh, well, I wasn't even involved in <laughs> teaching back then, uh, was quite different from what we are fa uh, facing today. Yeah, in terms of what you just said about these parallel courses for ESL students, you know, I also have a master's in PSL and linguistics and have taught such classes for a number of years at Indiana University South Bend. And, uh, you point out in, in your writing that this seems to be a certain type of segregation of, of students, and I was wondering what you thought about uh, the administration or implementation of such classes and uh, whether they should be strictly for international students in order for students who are not native speakers but live in the United States to <coughs> have to teach such classes or uh, I found it interesting in the conclusion of your article on this, you say, well, I'm not saying that we should cut out such classes because mm -hmm. a lot of students feel more comfortable. And mm -hmm. I found in my classes, even in terms of reading skills, you know, they, they felt more comfortable. But I've always had mostly international students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you think about right. how those classes should be implemented? When working with multilingual students in the university context, I think one of the most difficult issues, as I said before, is identifying them. Mm -hmm. and identifying their language proficiency, writing proficiency, as well as their identity positions. It's a complex task and sometimes students themselves don't know exactly where to position themselves or how to talk about uh, their language background with their peers and with their teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, and teachers, administrators, you know, people have tried different things and none, no placement procedure actually is uh, foolproof at this point. Um, so we find all kinds of students uh, in all kinds of different classes. And one of the key issues is to have as many different options available for students and to communicate the intent of each uh, option to the students so that they can make intelligent decisions. A lot of times having a separate course um, to from the student's perspectives means that, oh, then I don't have to suffer through the first year accomplishment requirement. I can take something that's easier <laughs> for me. Right, and then uh, be done with it. And that's not necessarily how it works, but students don't always know that. <laughs> and some students who are uh, closer in terms of linguistic profile to native English speak, uh, speaking students might choose to enroll in ESL classes because they think it's an easier version of the composition class, which is not always true, which, which shouldn't be true, really. Um, it's, in some ways, it's a lot harder um, so the students and the teachers need to be aware of not so much of what's easier or what's fun, more fun to teach, uh, etc., but in terms of uh, what's more appropriate for the particular student needs. And that kind of assessment can't happen in his office alone or in the por portfolio reading committee or placement committee meetings, but it actually has to happen in the classroom too because, as I said, the placement procedures aren't going to uh, successfully identify all the students and put them in appropriate classes. So one of the responsibilities uh, for us as writing teachers is to get to know the students. And when, of course, we've always tried to get to know our students, but in ways that we never imagined before. Um, and while still remaining sensitive to the students' need to identify themselves and construct their identity in a certain way, and 18-year-old you know, students are especially vulnerable 
to uh, the kind of uh, identity construction in the classroom, both by the teachers and by the peers. Um, and so they are sensitive and sometimes that prevents them from uh, identifying themselves in ways that can uh, allow us to help them uh, when there is a need. We have small writing classes. They're capped at 15, but a lot of them are smaller than that. So, you know, there's an opportunity really to get to know your students. I have found it um, somewhat challenging to get to know some of my international students. Um, and I'm assuming that there might be some cultural barriers there. But one of the, we have a, a fairly large contingent of young men from. Um, Yes. Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And, um, I think, and this may be the case for the men in the classroom as well, but I'm assuming that certainly some of the women in the classroom have experienced that if there's a tension there. That this, that those, some of those students may be acculturated in such a way that they don't really appreciate necessarily having a female teacher. Mm -hmm. and, um, or, you know, one student who clearly um, last spring didn't was not responding to me, would, he would come a minute or two late, just late enough that there was no chance that he would have to interact with me, and would scoot out, you know, just before things broke. So, and, and any time I tried to directly interact with him, he would not make eye contact, he would find a way to sort of politely avoid me. And it was really difficult to figure out how to engage with him as a student. And, just thinking about a, a, a lot of that comes in, maybe it's my discomfort with a different culture and not knowing how to bridge that gap, but do you encounter this sort of thing? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, I, I think I know what you're talking about, and to some extent, I can actually see that. I just moved into a new neighborhood, <laughs> and although I'd like to meet my neighbors, knocking on their door or just you know, talking to, to them on the street, it takes a lot of courage on my part and on their part too. Right. And so, sometimes you know, doing classroom activities or you know, having, having a, ex an excuse to start an, uh, an interaction, you know, such as Halloween, I'm looking forward to that because people will come and visit. Right. <laughs> 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 right, so then I say, hey, I'm new here, right? Um, mm -hmm, right, so, so taking, um, making use of those opportunities, institutionalized opportunities might be one. Uh, and in the classroom context, a write, you know, if it's a writing, well, it is a writing classroom. So, you know, getting them to write about, you know, some of the um, differences between high school classroom culture, the you know, teacher-student relationship, and what they are experiencing now, and not necessarily about the relationship between you, um, you and the student, uh, but you could ask them to talk about teachers in general, and you know, students from the U.S. can also probably appreciate that as well, because high school and college, as we are. Uh, discovering more and more as we engage in extended conversations with high school teachers uh, are quite different uh, fr from experientially for students and also institutionally. The kind of practices you know, that have evolved over time. Um, so, so it is a cross-cultural sort of boundary crossing for all students. And the reason that I emphasize for all students is because if we did this just for international students, it would be singling them out, constructing them in a certain way. But if we did this for everyone and talked about it in ways that everyone can relate to, um, I, I think that may actually uh, be a good starting point. And the reason I'm, I'm really sensitive about how to talk about it is um, there are teachers, well-intended teachers, who might sometimes ask students to um, talk about their home culture or home language. And for most traditional international students who just came from their home country and they're going back uh, right after they finish college, that's not a problem at all. And they've actually appreciate, uh, many, many people appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about what they know best. And, for other, and that's also a situation where teachers and other students <coughs> are uh, obligated to listen to their perspective. And, and people are, t uh, tend to be polite about you know, uh, what happens in, in that kind of conversation situation. Um, but for students who identify themselves as U.S. residents, students who don't want to disclose their second language identity because that 
um, they feel that it might jeopardize their relationship with other students. Or they may have had negative encounters in high school uh, in re relating to other uh, peers and to teachers. Um, so in Right, right. Yeah, in, in some cases it's an emotional experience. You know, some students' education may have been interrupted uh, because of the transition from one cultural and uh, national context to another, and also because of war and you know, the lack of uh, schools, period. I'm Shido. Um, the, the grant research that you did, I think one portion of the outcome was this book. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, I do not work for the Third St. Martin or NCT. <laughs> it is free from them. <laughs> and we had, this was just from our, this is from our shelves. And so, um, and it's several, um, it has several articles on all kinds of issues. I'm really curious about one of your research questions that you posed, and I'm not sure if you posed it specifically toward this, but I know you're continually working on it. Um, and I think Glenn has really identified one. Um, what are some of the key issues in working with second language writers that mainstream comp teachers, researchers, and administrators face? And I know, you know that it's a cultural issue and certainly there's the placement issue. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other issues that you see us facing? Right. Well, one obvious place to begin is the issue of grammar. And over the years, the field of composition has developed a certain sense of what grammar is, how it should be taught, or how it sh should not be taught. And those are appropriate for certain types of students. And that certain types of student happens to be mostly monolingual uh, native English speakers uh, who w grew up in uh, speaking dominant varieties of English. And those assumptions don't necessarily work for language minority students, including speakers of different varieties of English, African American English, uh, Caribbean Creole English, you name it, you know, and non-native English speakers. And the, one of the problems is that um, I can't ask, right, and, and in, in my own program too, I used to run a writing program at UNH, University of New Hampshire. You know, although uh, I try to help um, my staff members you know, understand the issues involved in working with language issues, um, I can't expect them to know all the issues and all the answers and present that to students. Uh, Non-native English speakers, because they have not internalized the structure of grammar, uh, the English grammar, that native English speakers have already internalized um, intuitively. Um, they might need a lot of help. You know, they, they might need teachers to point out, so here's what's happening and here's how it works. Even though it, might not, uh, it may not result in the immediate acquisition, but these um, um, encounters over the years actually do help them develop their awareness and as they engage in um, the output and input over the years, uh, they gradually develop their own sense of how the language works and when it's appropriate to use certain structures and things like that. And, and these are the kind of issues that native English speakers don't need necessarily need to even think about. Um, and one uh, common sort of pedagogical strategy that a lot of people use is reading uh, things aloud. And to a lot of students, this is a great uh, help because sometimes when they are trying to write, they are constructing their sentence, they are playing with the words and language structure so much so that it just doesn't seem to work together. But when they read it aloud or when they talk about what they are writing, um, they might sometimes come up with ways of explaining things that are much clearer and simpler than when they are just trying to uh, make it sound academic or uh, professional. And that works if the student has already internalized the sense of how the language is structured and how it works. Um, but that knowledge is not available to students. And if the teacher is not um, aware of what may be called pedagogical grammar, that is how we might explain the ways in which language works to the students, um, then this is a really difficult thing to address. 
Um, and I, I'm, you know, the, the reason I'm using this awkward phrase of pedagogical grammar um, is because um, it's different from uh, the traditional notion of sort of classroom grammar. You know, uh, well, it's, it's a developed and more appropriate version of classroom grammar. Uh, but it's not the kind of grammar that linguists talk about, because linguists are interested in the structure of language that's uh, several steps higher or more abstract than what we see on the page or what, when we, what we hear when people speak. And so teaching students transformational grammar might help students uh, think about language in a different and interesting ways does not necessarily lead to acquisition. Um, and that's one of the reasons that composition specialists in a long time ago just decided, okay, grammar is not it. This is not how we help students. Um, and some people have begun to talk about uh, what's called the rhetorical grammar, which is, um, again, the kind of pedagogical grammar that helps raise awareness of the students in terms of how um, different structure can emphasize different things or has, uh, uh, can create meaning, important social meaning in the process. And this is something that's useful both for native speakers and non-native speakers. Uh, but it falls short of addressing the kinds of language needs that non-native speakers might have. Okay. Um, so I don't have a solution yet. <laughs> I, just, I just asked for issues. I didn't right. ask for solutions. Yeah. OK, good, good. <laughs> then, then that's my answer. <laughs> In terms of how that would get implemented in the regular composition classroom, say, if you have some ESL students, uh, what would you, you know, suggest in terms of um, de-emphasizing grammar? Or, you know, I got my master's at the University of Utah where it was very influenced by uh, Krashen, whose ideas learn through immersion. And I even took like some foreign language classes like French where we had to write without paying attention to grammar and then mm -hmm. try to absorb some of the uh, the rules unconsciously, and uh, if grammar is emphasized, you know, one thing that I've learned in, in teaching ESL is to just focus on the things that really interfere with meaning, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, de-emphasize things like article usage and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. where you can still understand, but, you know, what suggestions would you give kind of the mainstream composition teacher as an ESL student who's struggling with grammar on mm -hmm. the guide that Well, a good student. place to start, as you said, is to look for meaning. And when, when I say meaning, some people say, well, focus on the meaning and not grammar. And that's not exactly what I mean. Focus on the meaning and through meaning, identify places where language needs to be worked on. Um, so if you get stuck in the middle of a paragraph, and if you, you, know, you may not be able to explain exactly why you got stuck, uh, but you can at least identify a place where the student need to work on, right? And you know, ignore other, you, you can initially at least, ignore other minor errors, uh, those are called local errors, that don't affect the, me uh, the meaning of what the student is trying to convey. But focus on uh, places where the meaning gets uh, unclear because of the uh, structure, uh, structural issues. And then uh, try to work on it. Uh, so, so that's how we might prioritize uh, working with errors, especially if students have a lot of errors. And if students have, uh, don't have a lot of global errors, then we can start working on some of the consistent, persistent errors, uh, such as uh, subject verb agreement and tense issues that don't necessarily interfere with meaning, but are nonetheless uh, mind-boggling and um, irritating to some teachers, um, unfriendly teachers. And you know, one of the things, um, issues, of course, is that it would be good to keep in mind that students are not going to learn everything that you want them to learn about the English language in a semester, how hard, no matter how hard you work. And to expect them, to, and one issue, another issue uh, that's related to this is how do we assess their writing when they have lots of grammar errors? And so one, one way to do it is to set a certain standard based on the non uh, native English speaker norm and say, well, this is what a college students are supposed to be able to do. Do it, and if you can't do it, you fail the course. Mm -hmm. okay? And that, that's the traditional sort of approach. And I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong uh, because there are occasions where uh, attaining certain level of language proficiency is important in professional context. But 
we also need to realize that the professional context that we imagine is not necessarily what we think it is. Uh, there are companies during job interview situations um, that the companies that train their interviewers to ignore language issues specifically and to train these personnel uh, com committee people so that they can look for most qualified individuals rather than people who have different accents or grammar errors from there, uh, here and there. And another example is, um, well, if you look at lots of ads and labels on products and, and the manuals that comes with the printers, computers, everything, pretty much everything you buy today, you know, um, you see multilingual manuals. Businesses are much more savvy about the social linguistic reality. They want to reach out to their customers. They may actually value employees who can speak multiple languages, although the English language may not be their uh, strength, um, so that they can actually conduct business in ways that make sense. But somehow, we English teachers uh, over the years have developed this huge uh, idea about what people in general expect, business people expect. And although they do affect um, pe um, people's perception of the speakers, um, Larry Beeson has a study that shows errors do irritate a lot of business people and they tend to make all kinds of judgments about the speakers or and writers. They are sloppy, they are they're not good business um, first people, you know, so, so the whole person is being evaluated on the basis of a few grammar errors. But another, one thing that we need to realize is, is that he didn't look at non-native English speakers in that study. And people's reaction to non-native speakers is actually quite different. Um, studies of what's called error gravity uh, across different disciplines have shown that, uh, and, and there, there are mixed results, of course, uh, that in some situations, some professors uh, can more easily ignore errors that are made by non-native speakers or errors that are typically associated with non-native speakers than they are willing to ignore errors that native English speakers typically make. So that's one indication. Um, uh, a question that follows up on that. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about the international students that I have had in these first year writing courses, and wanting to strike a healthy and productive balance between focusing on their ideas and not getting distracted, mm -hmm. but also not wanting to evaluate them in a way where they will have shock when they move into another professor's class who just mm -hmm. slams them for mm -hmm. errors. Right. Like, how do you um, support them mm -hmm. and, and focus on their ideas without setting expectations? I actually had a student in my class who had gotten A's throughout high school, who really had some profound uh, difficulties with English. She was a native speaker of Spanish. Mm -hmm. And when she came to work with me, she said, I'm so frustrated that my high school English teachers gave me A's. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in college, and I can't get higher than a C, and I don't understand like what happened there. Mm -hmm. So do you mm -hmm. have any suggestions for ways that we could frame to our students that transition out of our class where we may be more willing to work with them mm -hmm. into that more hostile, perhaps, mm -hmm. environment. Right. I think it's, yeah, I think what you're saying is you know, absolutely right and important. That is, there are people who are willing to overlook non-native English speaker errors. And there are people who would insist on holding on to the, the traditional standards that are based on proficient uh, native English speakers who are probably middle class, upper middle class, privileged positions, speakers of dominant varieties of English. And what do we do about it? Um, well, for one thing, we can help students understand the social linguistic reality in which they live and work. And tell them that there are certain people who would say that this is really problematic, so you need to work on it. But um, in this class, we will work on the meaning as well, uh, that's, because that's important. Or if you do want to include grammar as part of the grades, uh, you can uh, distribute the, gram uh, the grades or proportionally so that students are not penalized unnecessarily or uh, in ways that are out of proportion uh, when other aspects of writing is really good. And 
seeing, drawing that line when we don't have clear guidelines in our minds or in the form of uh, some, some kind of rubric that we might use for our personal uses in the classroom. Because when we don't have something uh, that's established, at least within ourselves, it's really easy to see a lot of errors and freak out. Or sometimes uh, certain kinds of errors might distract us so much that we can't see through those errors. Um, so setting some kind of standards for us to ourselves and communi communicating the rationale behind why you are doing what you are doing and how you are apportioning different aspects of writing uh, to the students, I think would be one solution. And another thing is that um, some teachers in the past, uh, and, and people still do, have encouraged students to experiment with language and don't worry about grammar errors because you know, people who don't believe in, uh, who think that grammar should be all perfect are wrong. Now, it would be great if everybody thought that, <laughs> but that's not the case. And if we encourage students to just do whatever they want, you know, what happens is when they take another class, they might fail the class. And that student will probably blame the teacher who failed the student and not you, the writing teacher. And we feel good when we say that. When you, it, <laughs> you, know, you, you can do whatever you want. You can be creative. It's OK to be different, right? Um, now, that, that, that sending, I, I think that's uh, doing disservice to our students when we don't give students a clear sense of the reality out there. So teach them um, the standards as much as we can. And also teach them to negotiate the standards, you know, give them some strategies that they might use. And I have, um, I'll probably talk about, well, I will talk about it uh, this afternoon, later this afternoon. And then um, also tell them the risks involved in trying to negotiate these standards because sometimes students are not in a position to tell the teacher, well, I think this is how it should be done, right? Um, and another thing that we can do as writing teachers, and you know, one of the reasons I like this program, uh, from what I know, is that this is a university writing program and not just an English department writing program or just a composition program working with first year students, but it, uh, this program deals with all kinds of faculty members and students. Now what that enables you to do is to be an advocate for students or at least an informant or an educator for the whole campus. That is, get the word out about um, how language that is actually being used and what kind of uh, back linguistic background students are bringing in today and how teachers might actually work with these students in productive ways. Right. Well, the rationale for doing less reading uh, would be because it takes more time excuse me, for students to process the reading materials. And when the reading, I mean, sometimes, you know, there are classes where students receive a lot of reading assignments and they are intimidated, but uh, they are proud of being in that class and being able to succeed, you know, despite the amount of work that they have to do. Uh, you know, sometimes students solidify uh, on the basis of how tough the teacher is. <laughs> and and that, that's part of the sort of high school culture. You know, a lot of students, when they write personal narratives, you know, talk about that experience as coming of age uh, narrative. And non-native English speakers, if they are not used to reading a lot of materials, would be intimidated and may not actually be able to process all the material uh, to the extent that they need to in order to understand uh, and <coughs> write about it or to have discussion in class. Um, so I, I would uh, say, you know, try to be moderate in assigning um, reading assignments and also be specific about what you want accomplished uh, through these reading assignments. Sometimes um, teachers feel that, well, I want students to interpret this in different ways, so I don't want to give too many guidelines, or I don't want to restrict students' uh, ability to interpret things. Uh, in a li literature class, that's a real concern. Uh, but in other classes in the discipline, oftentimes readings are assigned for specific purposes. 
and teachers know that and sometimes teachers assume that students know that as well and that's not always the case so it would be a good idea if you do have a certain agenda in mind uh, why you are assigning a particular piece of reading and what kind of approach you want them to take as they use the reading just pr pr providing that contextual information uh, might actually be uh, useful for students who are not familiar with the classroom culture uh, of the U.S. higher education. I'm wondering as well what you think about how to deal with other types of uh, discourse conventions that might differ between cultures. Like uh, one example, uh, ideas of how to quote or mm -hmm. ideas of originality, how to deal with research types of papers. Uh, I taught a first year seminar here where I, half of my students were Saudi Arabian and mm -hmm. uh, I had them do research papers and I had it done in sections but uh, a, a lot of times they would tend to like, quote large sections kind of unsighted and mm -hmm. I know another instructor in our program had some um, uh, some problems where she was actually like taking it to authorities that she thought this was plagiarism and mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really unpleasant and mm -hmm. uh, you know how to deal with um, different expectations for what constitutes you know originality mm -hmm. or how to argue a position against sources mm -hmm. that's something a lot of suggestions right um, a lot of times um, in working with international students especially um, even ESL specialists have often talked about it in terms of cultural differences, how different cultures and languages have different structures and different ways of citing sources that need to be valued. And to some extent, uh, there's a grain of truth in that uh, point of view. But uh, in reality, a lot of times, students may be quoting a huge chunk of text from the source text, not because that's what they're used to doing in their high school classes or college classes even, but because uh, they don't want to paraphrase that much information, or they don't know how to paraphrase that information. And showing them in concrete ways with examples and also you know, with uh, layered practices, you know, uh, recursive practi uh, practices, okay, here's how it's done, here's why it's done, and things like that, giving them the repertoire and strategies. I think it uh, might take care of a lot of issues. And it's true that people in other countries are not <coughs> used to the discourse of plagiarism that have become so prevalent in this country. And one side effect of the discourse of plagiarism in this country is d plagiarism is del dealt with as some sort of a sin <laughs> uh, you know, or a crime. And so, so the emphasis is on uh, protecting the, the, uh, the work of others. Right? It's an ethical issue and legal issue. And not so much, um, you know, we don't place enough emphasis on the fact that how discourse is constructed by appropriating other people's text and how we act normally and naturally combine them in order to come up with new insights. You know, uh, nobody has I can write a whole article with only original insights, right? Uh, everybody's sort of appropriating different ideas and assembling them in different ways. Uh, sometimes, you know, ideas are uh, in the air that are not, that can't be attributed to anybody else. Or sometimes a term that has been coined by a certain individual, like discourse community, has become a property of the whole discourse community. <laughs> so that uh, it's appropriate to use that term without citing a particular source, unless you are specifically critiquing the history of that term, etc. Right? Uh, so, so even with that same term, there are times when it's necessary to cite the source, and then there are other times when it's not necessary. And students don't get the full picture, oftentimes, because we don't bother to explain them. Um, so, um, emphasizing that, and, and also um, in the first year teaching uh, practicum course that I've taught at UNH, one of the things that I tried to emphasize at the beginning uh, of the preparation process was you know, not, not talk about plagiarism first, but to talk about different ways in which we use reading in the writing classroom. So one of them is to cite sources as a source of information. Right. So this is a traditional way of teaching citation. But there are other reasons that we cite sources. One of them is we cite sources so that, that we can critique that person. Right. And if we said something and then attacked it, it sounds like you're sort of 
came up with a great idea, then you're attacking yourself. <laughs> but if you said, well, here's this person who says something like this, and then you add your commentary, right? There is something, a new knowledge that's being created by appropriating another source. Of course, the source is attrib you know, attributed. Um, and that's a different kind of citation than credit, giving credit to the author. You are actually citing to discredit that author, <laughs> right? Um, and that, that kind of thing, I mean, talking about it and making it ex explicit through examples, um, I think would be really helpful. What am I working on? Well, I have lots of deadlines right now. <laughs> and I've just finished one, and it's a uh, handbook of writing development, um, and kind of a historical overview of how the field of the second language writing evolved, and how the notion of like, writing development, different theories of learning, um, have influenced it. So I've just, uh, I just sent off my manuscript last night, uh, before I got <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And a couple of new, new research projects. Well, another project that I've completed, uh, the data collection, and I'm, I'm drafting uh, right now, is on the role of voice and identity in academic writing. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people talk about voice in terms of personal identity and how each individual writer has a unique identity in their writing. And I although it's a useful and attractive concept, not many people have been successful in defining it in, in tangible ways. Uh, so I came up with a definition of voice uh, that's fairly tangible and that can be actually studied. Uh, and so, so that was my first uh, project that I published in 2001. And then I took that notion and said, well, this notion of voice can also apply, uh, uh, can also work in academic context. So I did a mock uh, case study of a manuscript review for a journal. And I had one author and two reviewers and sent the manuscript to the two reviewers and then said, could you review this as if you are reviewing for this particular journal? And we collected the reviews and then had a post hoc interview. And in the in interview, uh, my uh, collaborator, Chris Tardy, and I were interested in their construction of voice in that reading process, but we didn't tell them that. We said, we are interested in the process of uh, manuscript review in general. And even before we mentioned anything about voice or identity, uh, they started asking about, so um, is this person male or female? I think it's male because, uh, and, and few people are fairly conscious about who the writer is. Sometimes we think, we know exactly who that person is. Other times we have a general sense of the profile. Well, this person might be from the Midwest, or this person is probably from um, a well-educated family, uh, etc. You know, we make these assumptions, and we do that about students as well in the classroom. And that often affects how we interact with the students. You know, even if the student if, um, is a good writer, if, if they have a uh, cocky attitude in their writing, we might not like them, and our responses, the kind of comments that we, you know, we might be, uh, ask harsher questions uh, to them than when we work with pe students who sort of are, present themselves as helpless but <laughs> willing learner, right? Um, so identity, you know, I, th I think matters in writing and even in academic writing. So I was trying to show that through this mock uh, study. And then I, as a follow-up, I did a survey study of editorial board, mem board members of I think not six or seven uh, different journals in composition studies, rhetoric, and technical writing, and applied linguistics. And basically asked them, do you think about the author identity when you review? How? What kind of things do you look for? And kind of confirmed what we found in a smaller uh, case study. So, so that's uh, something that I've um, um, continuing to develop. I, I, no, I, I think we probably... Oh. Can I ask one, one maybe fast question? It's a big question, though. You can answer it quickly. Uh -oh. what, what do you think um, might happen in uh, graduate education? Your characterization of the, the, the divorce of, of linguistics, textual orientation from social rhetorical things, um, will we... S 
will we, should we see a, a bigger place for linguistics or applied linguistics TESOL in, quote, regular uh, PhD programs in RedComp, or uh, are these now just two different worlds that we're straining to keep together? Mm -hmm. Well, um, people have been trying to bring them together. Um, for example, people who are interested in genre uh, have been getting together occasionally to see where um, the other camp is now and see if they can sort of collaborate or at least start a conversation that's more productive. Uh, that's another sort of area of, between applied linguistics and accomplish and that was uh, fairly clearly split between the language sort of emphasis and uh, social orientation. And every time they try to do that, the conversation just don't go anywhere. Uh, they, they've been failing miserably. But people are uh, beginning to come closer uh, as rhetorically oriented general theorists are beginning to realize the importance of focusing on language issues and language uh, oriented uh, general theorists are beginning to realize that they can't uh, account for everything that they want to account for without taking into consideration the social and political factors. Uh, so th uh, there are points of convergences that I see uh, and in the classroom context people are finally coming to terms with the fact that they do have multilingual writers in their classes and they need to do something about it. They're not going to disappear. Um, and so there are more and more programs that are uh, beginning to offer coursework in second language writing, for example, or language issues. And uh, special, there are special issues of journals, such as College English just did one, and other, uh, and WPA also did one. Um, and I happen to be involved in both of them. Uh, uh, and um, there's a lot more emphasis at co conferences, uh, professional conferences and workshops um, on language issues. Um, and what's ironic is that uh, in the 80s, one of the most vocal proponents of getting rid of linguistics uh, or dissociating linguistics from composition was Sharon Crowley, who is now my colleague at uh, ASU. <laughs> Uh, and we haven't had a conversation about this yet. Um, <laughs> but I, I think uh, what's happening is that uh, the con conception of linguistics is also shifting. Um, and within linguistics, there's a split that's, that has already happened, actually, uh, between more traditional structural uh, Chomskyan linguistics, on the one hand, theoretical linguistics, as they call it, and applied linguistics, which deals with real-world language issues. Um, and um, I think there are lots of things that applied linguists and compositionists can talk about. Uh, not only about non-native English speakers, but also about all kinds of issues, such as voice, genre, and rhetorical grammar, and um, things like that. Well, we look forward to your, your talk, but we need to leave you time to, I don't know, enjoy the blue skies or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.